Hey everybody, welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast. Today we're bringing you a recording from the Home Affairs Committee, which holds a one-off session on the state of fire and rescue services. This was held on the 2nd of March when it took evidence from Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Fire and Rescue Services, Sir Thomas Windsor, and Chair of the National Fire Chiefs Council, Mark Hardingham. You will also at times hear from Roy Wiltshire, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services. Now, in a consistent effort to bring you the front line of the emergency services, this is a recording from Parliament Live TV, and you can access it on their website. For some background, following its most recent round of inspections while praising the fire and rescue services as highly skilled and respected by the public, the inspector have issued 11 causes for concern for the 13 services reviewed in 2021. The chief inspector has also stated that there needs to be fundamental reform to ensure the service becomes more effective and efficient. The committee explored the reasons for this recommendation, and it also takes into account the performance of the services in the face of additional challenges posed by the pandemic as well as the broad issues raised including recruitment challenges and diversity this session provided an opportunity for sir thomas windsor to give his reflections in his final months as chief inspector now for some quick sticky terms and conditions this content is produced by parliament live tv and the corporate officer of the house of commons for house of commons proceedings or the corporate officer of the house of lords or house of lords proceedings or both corporate officers or joint proceedings we are permitted to use this material only to make a fair and accurate report of the parliamentary proceedings the use of this material has not been edited at all And we are not going to pass any comments on the material either. It is not meant for satire, ridicule or denigration. This recording is being provided to give you a greater insight into the report for those that perhaps don't go over and use parliamentary TV. You will note there is no advertising, promotion or commercial sponsorship associated with the production of this. We are not using this material in any way that suggests that the UK Parliament or any individual member endorses, promotes, supplies or approves anything from the Firefighters podcast. And nothing shared here will bring any member of UK Parliament or any individual member into disrepute. This recording is available free to you from our hosting platform and does not need to be listened to on any podcast platform. And again, we will receive no financial gain for sharing this information with you. So with all of that scariness out of the way, the following is the live recording from Parliament Live TV and I hope you find it interesting. Uh, Well, good morning, everybody. Um, This is the uh, Home Affairs Select Committee um, inquiry today into the fire and rescue uh, service. It's our first opportunity, I think, as a committee to to look at the fire and rescue service, and we're really pleased uh, to have the three witnesses before us today. Uh, Sir Thomas Windsor, who's Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services, Uh, Roy Wiltshire, Her Majesty's Inspector of Fire and Rescue Services, and Mark Hardingham, Chair of the National Fire Chiefs Council. So you're very welcome today. Um, The way I intend to run the session is that we will, uh, first of all, concentrate on the fire and rescue services, and there are a number of questions we will want to ask you uh, today. And then about quarter past 11, uh, we would like particularly to hear from uh, Sir Tom about his experiences as the Chief Inspector um, I know, Sir Tom, you're standing down at the end of this month, so we're very keen to hear from you, and in particular uh, around your views on policing in light of some of of the recent events that we've um, seen. So if if that's all right, and that means then the the other two witnesses, if you want to uh, sit in the public gallery or remain where you are, that's absolutely fine, but that's the way I intend to, to deal with this morning's proceedings. Okay, if I could just start us off then, um, and I will um, ask Sir Tom, first of all, if he could set out um, what his concerns are about the fire and rescue service um, currently, and particularly in light of the challenges that the fire and rescue service are now facing, um, and reflect a little bit perhaps on what's happened in the most recent times in terms of covid and new threats or ongoing threats such as flooding uh, and how that's handled by fire and rescue. So I'll come to Sir Tom first and then I'll take the other witnesses. Thank you, Chair. And um, I'm naturally happy to deal with the policing uh, things at the end, although um, HMI Wilshire is also Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary uh, with special responsibility for uh, domestic abuse. Um, the concerns, the principal concerns, um, are in relation to uh, culture and uh, preparedness 
uh, to cope with the things that are thrown at the Fire and Rescue Service. Um, you may want to ask the question, could another Grenfell happen? Um, there is a, um, an importance attached to protection and prevention, which we can go into. Um, but the, um, the influence and uh, conduct of the Fire Brigades Union is a drag on reform, um, uh, particularly uh, in matters concerning the true role of the firefighter. Uh, and uh, there have been disagreements, uh, quite severe disagreements, in some parts of the country in relation to the, um, the ability or the willingness of firefighters to deal with a marauding terrorist attack, uh, which we may come to as well. Perhaps, um, perhaps you could just explain that a little bit more. Well, when a marauding terrorist attack takes place, um, uh, if it ever does, um, the, um, the police will, of course, go in first and uh, do everything they can to neutralise uh, the, uh, the terrorists. Um, but there is a need for uh, the other two emergency services, firefighters and ambulance, to enter uh, the zone, not the hot zone where live rounds are being fired and, and uh, the greatest threat to life, but there is still a threat to life as they go in to recover casualties and to put out fires if, if any have been started. And uh, in two parts of the country uh, there have been uh, disagreements, uh, this is Merseyside and London, as to whether or not the firefighters in question, whether that is a proper role for firefighters and whether they should be paid extra uh, in order to undertake those duties. And um, uh, I take the view, and the government takes the view, and the NFCC takes the view uh, that firefighters are already being paid for this, and therefore a 2% pay rise on top of the 1.5% that they've already been agreed nationally is unjustified. It is paying twice for the same thing. I wrote to uh, the um, Commissioner of the London Fire Brigade and the Chief Fire Officer um, uh, in Merseyside and said that there is uh, no justification for proceeding in this way. Uh, but, um, it's Merseyside or Manchester? Merseyside. Merseyside, yeah. Merseyside. Oh, Manchester, sorry. Yeah, it's sorry, Manchester. I said Merseyside, Merseyside yeah. I meant yeah. Manchester. Um, oh, it's uh, Manchester and London, the, correct. the two areas. Correct, I'm so sorry. Right. Okay. Yes. I don't know why I said Merseyside. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, th that is unjustified and, uh, and should not proceed. Uh, but we can go into that a little bit more as you want. But um, the, uh, the overall picture, though, uh, which I should um, emphasize at the beginning, is that uh, the vast majority of firefighters continue to work very hard to help their communities. They deserve our thanks, uh, particularly for the risks they take, of course, and uh, for the, uh, the way in which they handled the pandemic. But again, the Fire Brigades Union uh, attempted to uh, uh, prevent, in some parts of the country, the um, firefighters from uh, helping with the vaccination program uh, because they said it was not part of their function. Uh, I think that caused a conflict with firefighters because they wanted to help. And indeed, in many, many, many cases, they did help. Um, so and was that localised as well? Was that in particular areas? Uh, where was it? There was a, a general notice from the Fire Brigade Union for firefighters not to help with vaccination, vaccination programme. So it was across the country. Okay. Um, but um, overall we're finding that the performance of fire and rescue services are improving. I think that uh, when the government just, uh, announced its intention to uh, create an inspectorate and then they gave it to us, so it's not a separate inspectorate, for fire and rescue services. Uh, the fire and rescue service, or at least in some parts of the country, thought that this would be um, a jolly good idea. Um, and I think they still think so. But what they weren't perhaps anticipating was that we would um, find things that uh, were not as good as they should be, and we have done that. But what it does do, and we've been doing the police since 1856, so we apply the same techniques... Uh, what it does do is it exposes uh, weaknesses but also highlights strengths and allows Fire and Rescue Services in one part of the country to see very clearly 
how well other fire and rescue services are doing particular things and therefore to bring everyone up to the standard, well, to move everyone up towards the standard of the best. So that's uh, of considerable importance. The other thing I would mention, which I expect we'll get on to, is the operational independence of um, chief fire officers. Chief fire officers, unlike chief constables, are squeezed from two angles. Um, they are subject to um, political oversight, which can, of course, um, uh, intrude into political pressure, undue political pressure, to do things or not to do things. Um, and that can happen in policing as well, and we may get onto that. Probably won't have time, but we may get onto uh, that uh, uh, in, in the case of policing. But chief fire officers, unlike chief constables, also face pressure from uh, the other end of the spectrum, which is from uh, a very powerful trade union, the Fire Brigades Union, uh, who do have the right to withdraw their labour, and from time to time do threaten to do so. So the chief fire officer is squeezed, or can be squeezed, and therefore his or her freedom to make operational decisions is constrained, and we can go into some of the specifics uh, like that. Um, the government have been working on a fire reform white paper for quite a while. We're expecting it pretty soon. Um, I said in my last State of Fire report, which we sent to the committee, uh, which we published not that long ago, that I was concerned that the wind speed of reform had reduced to a flutter. I think that the wind speed is about to pick up again, and that's very much uh, to be welcomed. So those are my general reflections. Thank you. Uh, Mr Wiltshire, do, do you want to add anything to that? I, I think uh, just to re-emphasize a few things, as, as uh, Sir Tom said towards the end, the, the, the Fire and Rescue Service does do a very good job. There's you know, highly trained, motivated individuals working across the country. I think sometimes they're uh, withheld from helping as much as they could do. So the flexibility to use that fantastic resource in many areas, from the pandemic to flooding to many other areas, is sometimes constrained by uh, the, not only the union, but the, the flexibility of uh, the employment uh, contracts. I think reform is required. Uh, the, some cultural reforms, certainly equalities, diversity, uh, inclusion. Uh, and there's a major turnover of leadership, as there is in a lot of public sector, which can cause uh, problems with experience. But overall, a, a great service. Sir Tom's covered most of the things we'll probably go deeper into, but uh, yes, some reform is needed. Right. Uh, well, we will certainly have questions on a number of the points that, that have mm -hmm. been raised. Um, so, Mr uh, Hardingham, would you like to comment on the current state of the Fire and Rescue Service? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And um, just picking up from uh, where Sir Tom and, and Roy started, really, I mean, from the perspective of the National Fire Chiefs Council, um, we've welcomed and embraced the role of the new inspectorate um, as an investment in the Fire and Rescue Service um, and part of the what's been the catalyst for uh, change and what we think we're now on the cusp of further reform through the white paper in the Fire and Rescue Service as well. And we've worked closely with the inspectorate throughout their tenure of inspecting fire and rescue services to collectively uh, shape and inform their work with them and then pick up the findings and recommendations uh, in terms of our role in supporting fire and rescue services uh, in England but equally across the UK as well because the NFCC is a uh, UK-wide uh, body. If I was to pick out um, just, um, just three or four uh, of the issues in terms of uh, the current picture for fire and rescue services, um, I think the fire service is um, a service that continues to be held in extremely high regard uh, by the public. Uh, and by the partners with whom we work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think we've seen evidence of that through the course of the pandemic um, in the last couple of years, but also in the ongoing business-as-usual work, up to and including the fire services response with partners through local resilience forums in terms of the storms that played out across the country over the course of the last uh, two or three weeks. Uh, but of course, alongside that, um, we're self-aware and we know that the Fire and Rescue Service is not perfect by any stretch, and there are areas where we want to see reform and we want to see improvement. Um, and certainly, um, colleagues have talked about the industrial relations climate uh, that sits across the Fire and Rescue Service, uh, which isn't new. It has, it's been like that uh, for a long time. 
um, and the trade unions, and there are more than one, although the focus does tend to be on the Fire Brigade Union, there are several trade unions across the Fire and Rescue Service, have an important role to play um, in, the, in the future of the Fire and Rescue Service. Um, but I think there is reform needed of that industrial relations climate and the machinery that sits around that. Um, the role of the Fire and Rescue Service, it feels like we're on the cusp of an opportunity here. Fire services um, have got the traditional role that the public expect them to do around preventative work, protecting work in terms of building safety, and also our operational response role both locally and nationally. Uh, but I do think there are opportunities to broaden that role of firefighters uh, and the Fire and Rescue Service more generally, and we've seen good examples of that through the pandemic, and I hope that the White Paper and the reform enables us to do that. Um, there are challenges in the service around um, equality, diversity and inclusion. Uh, we are um, predominantly uh, a white male organisation and have been for some time and that's right through the organisation. Um, and when we look forward, uh, I with my collectively with senior colleagues recognise that uh, increased diversity in the Fire and Rescue Service in many forms um, is part of the secret of a more successful and better Fire and Rescue Service in the future. So there is more we need to do in terms of recruiting a more diverse workforce, retaining a more diverse workforce and supporting a more diverse workforce to work their way through the Fire and Rescue Service to fully achieve whatever their individual's potential uh, might be. Uh, and then the final piece I would pick up would be around funding of the Fire and Rescue Service, like all other parts of the public sector and society more generally. Um, there have been challenges over the course of uh, the last 10, 12 years uh, through the, the period of austerity. Um, not all challenges, of course, that does create opportunities as well around productivity, efficiency and innovation. But in general terms, the funding of the Fire and Rescue Service through a period of reform in the future uh, does need to be looked at, in my view, in terms of the funding formula and how that works uh, and the disparity that exists uh, across Fire and Rescue Service as a consequence of a formula that's probably 15 years old now. Thank you, Chairman. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And we're now going to, to move to some specific questions on a number of the points you've raised. So, uh, Paula Barker, first of all. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I may, Mr Hardingham, um, just to come back to you on the industrial relations element, um, because the report has described the culture in some of the fire and rescue services as toxic. So when we actually talk about culture, um, would you agree that those at the top have to uh, bear the biggest responsibility? And also, um, in respect of the toxic culture uh, that apparently exists, would you say that it's a result of an adversarial nature of industrial relations across the service? Um, because certainly the f many firefighters that I speak to uh, do feel aggrieved um, by what they describe as an aggressive culture um, that exists within the service. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so I think when I think about the culture in the Fire and Rescue Service, I see lots of different cultures in the service and I see many cultures which are extremely positive. Um, I won't go through those because that's not the, the thrust of your question, but I do think there are some really positive cultures in the service, uh, collectively, uh, within teams and individually in the service as well. Uh, but you're right, there, there are areas, and the inspectorate has highlighted some of those, where there are areas where the culture of the Fire and Rescue Service isn't right. Um, there is, as you say, absolutely a senior leadership responsibility around the culture of the Fire and Rescue Service, indeed any organisation, and every person in a leadership role in the Fire and Rescue Service has a responsibility around what impact they can have in the culture of the organisation um, as well. Um, the industrial relations climate does play into that. Um, the nature of industrial relations in the Fire and Rescue Service right throughout my career um, in the service in many different roles um, has, uh, has often been quite adversarial um, and there, are, there is responsibility on both parties in terms of how do you create a better industrial relations climate and I know uh, my senior colleagues across the country work hard to create positive industrial relations climate whether that's at a local level at a regional level or at a national level uh, with the respective trade unions they're working with. Can you give some examples of, of those positive steps that are being taken? 
Yeah, so, so there are um, many examples where fire and rescue services across the country have been able to bring in changes to how they operate their fire and rescue service and have done that in consultation and negotiation uh, with local, regional and national uh, officials. But surely that's just your normal industrial relations collective bargaining. You're saying that the leadership are taking positive steps to um, you know, um, stop a toxic culture and a yeah. toxic relationship. So aside from the normal collective bargaining machinery, yeah. what positive steps are management okay. taking? So if I, if I sort of start at a national level, then the Fire and Rescue Service collectively, through the establishment of a, an independently chaired fire standards board, uh, is creating standards for the Fire and Rescue Service. One of those standards is a core code of ethics for the fire service, which sets out how does the fire and rescue service operate in an ethical way uh, at a senior leadership level, but right through all the organisation. That standard has been in place uh, probably about nine months now and is being implemented across fire and rescue services. If you build on that, then part of establishing the core code of ethics is that every fire and rescue service in the country will be setting up uh, a set of values and behaviours that are appropriate for their fire and rescue service and will be demonstrating those values and behaviours in terms of how they lead as senior leaders in their organisation and will be embedding those values and behaviours into their organisation in a very visible way right through to uh, frontline staff. Uh, I think then the, you, you have to weave and... and uh, equality and creating an inclusive environment is part of establishing that positive culture and then fire and rescue services across the country will be looking to weave in to the fabric of their organisation a much more inclusive uh, element to the organisation built on that code of ethics, built on those values, behaviours and standards and then they will promote that uh, and then I would expect obviously services to be dealing with um, the um, people who don't apply or operate uh, in leadership roles or other roles in accordance with those values, then that needs to be dealt with in an appropriate way from an education perspective, but then potentially um, further on from that if it's necessary and appropriate uh, in that occasion. The major, may, I may, I add, may I add something to that? How, do you have a, a su supplementary question from you, for yourself as well, Sir Tom, if I'm able? May I just, yeah, of course, very yeah. briefly, just to say what we found on inspection. So um, the Fire and Rescue Service hadn't been inspected as we inspect. Uh, them ever, and they, the last inspection regime, such as it was, was over 10 years ago. So they had a long period where they hadn't been really inspected. So when we did our round one inspections, and of course we're further on from that now, um, uh, we found in some parts really quite a toxic culture, um, disgraceful examples of bullying, harassment, discrimination, people being t uh, called inappropriate names, um, uh, poor behaviour towards female firefighters and female staff, um, poor treatment at the hands of operational staff compared to non-operational staff, and so on. And management, in some parts, doing little to address those problems. Uh, we uh, graded three fire and rescue services as inadequate for values and culture, and that is the bottom grade, and those were Avon, Essex and Gloucestershire um, and at the time 24% of respondents in the staff survey that we did felt bullied or harassed at work in the previous 12 months. Things have got a lot better mm -hmm. since then. Um, uh, now 84% of respondents to the staff survey um, uh, report that they are treated with dignity, courtesy and respect which is good. Um, we graded nine services as good uh, three of those services, Cambridgeshire, Cornwall and Merseyside, maintained their grade from number from round one. Six, the other six, all improved. And Avon jumped two grades uh, in this round from inadequate right up to good. And it's very rare for an inspected body to go and jump two grades. Um, so overall, the picture is improving. They're not perfect, but it is improving. I, I wish to give you those figures. Thank you. No, that's really helpful. Um, and obviously, um, as we've already heard from Mr Hardingham, you know, um, everyone has a part to play in terms of improving culture in an organisation. So um, I was reading the letter from the General Secretary of the Fire Brigade Union, which was sent to you in June 2021. Um, and I've also read the response to your report that was published in December 2021. Um, it would appear that they're not pleased with some of the key tenets 
of the report, uh, and I have to say, I do agree with them, um, because the language and aspects of the report is inflammatory, um, and some of it, if implemented, will seek to make industrial relations worse rather than better, I believe. Um, and surely that hardly serves the public interest. So I'd be interested to, to hear from you, Sir Tom, about what you believe the benefits are to firefighters and the public if the morale of the, fir of the workforce was to, to drop any further. Because uh, you've already said here today that you know people do have a right to withdraw their labour um, and the, the rights to, to use that as a leverage tactic to improve um, their pay and collective bargaining machinery. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that, please. Thank you. Um, I don't accept that morale is dropping um, uh, and dropping fast. Um, I think that is uh, rhetoric. Uh, which has um, a tangential uh, relationship to reality. Um, I do not believe that anything that I've published or said is inflammatory. It may be disagreeable, but it's not inflammatory. The, I think the principal objections of the Fire Brigades Union to what the positions that I've taken are in relation to the right to strike and the reform of the pay negotiating machinery. Uh, police officers don't have the right to strike. That was uh, taken away, well, if they ever had it, that was taken away from them uh, after the police strikes in 1919, um, so 100 years. Um, the Police Federation uh, was set up uh, as a result, and the Police Federation, uh, especially most recently, has done a good job in representing their members' interests. Um, but clearly, that is an industrial lever which, if you've got it, you don't want to give it up. Um, the position that I have taken is that if the right to strike is to be withdrawn, as I believe it should be, then it should be paid out. There is an X factor in police pay which deals with the fact that police officers do not have the right to strike, and there should be an X factor in firefighter pay. I don't think many firefighters really want to strike because they don't want to see people in desperate circumstances uh, left, uh, 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 left without assistance. Um, so I don't accept what the Fire Brigade's Union say about inflammatory language. Uh, clearly they are inflamed with anger at the prospect that the government may take my advice and remove the right to strike. That would, of course, require primary legislation, and Parliament makes the final decision on that, of course. Um, as far as the pay negotiating machinery is concerned, the current pay negotiating machinery uh, does have a considerable capacity for paralysis. And again, uh, if the Fire and Rescue Service were to go the way of the police uh, uh, service, um, then I think that there would be great improvements. Again, the FBU don't like that idea. Um, when I did the review of police pay and conditions and many other things uh, 12 years ago, 12 to 10 years ago, I recommended that the um, Police Negotiating Board, which did pay, um, should be abolished and replaced by uh, the police remuneration review body, pay review body for police. Parliament, uh, well, the government accepted that, asked Parliament to establish the new body, and Parliament did. And that body uh, has now taken the heat uh, as well as the um, difficulties largely out of pay reform for the police. Not completely. Um, the police superintendents the police federation are still very dissatisfied with the position of government because at the end of the day the government makes the decision on the pay bill because the government on behalf of taxpayers pays that bill. Um, so I think those are the two things that the FBU uh, most uh, object to but I don't accept that the way in which I've expressed these views is, can be characterised as inflammatory. Just finally, Chair, uh, if I may, um, because obviously you've talked about um, the police pay progression, and police actually receive progression um, progression pay each year, where firefighters only move between two levels for most roles, from trainee to uh, competent. Um, let me see... So would you agree that there is actually a gulf between the lower rung of the workforce and management, if you like, um, 
and I note that you say in the report to get higher pay they need promotion to command or management uh, responsibilities. Um, so would you agree that it fails to provide a fair reflection um, of their levels of experience, for example? Um, yes, to an extent that's true. Um, uh, clearly, the longer you do the job, the more experienced and competent you will be. So there is a case, and I would, you know, if Parliament accepts that there ought to be a fire service pay review body as there is in police, then that is exactly the kind of thing that the, that, that expert body could and should look at. Um, Police progression used to be automatic. You used to click up one grade as a constable, one grade every year, and then and then there was an eleventh grade which was abolished. Um, but under my proposals, which have been largely accepted, um, police officers progress up the uh, the progression ladder uh, only so far and can only get further up the ladder. Uh, provided they pass uh, appropriate as tests in relation to skills and competences. Uh, also, the pay ladder is seven points instead of ten or eleven, and that means that people can go up faster. It seems to me that um, um, uh, there is a perfectly good case for a future pay review body or some other body to assess firefighter pay according to the same principles. I can't see why those principles should be different. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Loughton. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, Tom, can I just come back to your, th- th- this comment about vaccinations and the advice from the FBU, which I wasn't aware of. What, what was the rationale behind the FBU advising their members not to have anything to do with vaccinations during the pandemic? Um, because they weren't being paid for it. Um, it wasn't part of the core role of the firefighter. I'll defer to my two colleagues on either side, but um, it, was, uh, it was one heck of a sticking point. So I should like to come yes. in first. So, um, so when the pandemic um, started um, and when Roy was in the role that I'm in now, um, there was um, a, a, a body set up with the Fire Brigade Union, with the National Fire Chiefs Council and with the employers uh, to look at how could the Fire and Rescue Service um, support communities and partners through the pandemic as well as their own staff. Uh, and uh, those, there was um, sought to develop what was called a tripartite agreement, and the intention was the tripartite agreement would have a, would be a set of principles within which the fire service would reach in to support the pandemic, and then those principles would be supported by safe systems of work, training, um, and PPE, etc., to enable firefighters and other people working in the fire service to do that safely. The tripartite agreement, instead of becoming uh, an enabling um, tool for fire and rescue service actually um, became a, a largely a disabling tool for fire and rescue service because it ended up largely as a list of things that the fire and rescue service would do um, or could do if it was asked to do so through local resilience forums and with partners. And then in services, uh, once that national agreement was enacted in services, chief fire officers uh, were being asked to do things through the local resilience forum, were engaging, as you would expect, with, um, with the Fire Brigade Union and other representative bodies in terms of how would you go about reaching in to do that role safely with your workforce. Uh, and if it wasn't on the list, on the tripartite agreement, um, then the pushback was that actually it can't be done and it shouldn't be done. And the Fire Brigade Union, as a consequence of that, effectively discouraged their members from taking part in that additional activity. And one of those activities was about providing either logistical support or firefighters administering vaccines uh, into members of the public, which actually did happen anyway. So the fire service have vaccinated uh, more than 550,000 people across the country during the course of the pandemic, but have done it in spite of um, the uh, work that was done around the tripartite agreement. I, I just find that, it. Uh, and all credit to those uh, fire officers who did step up, because an awful lot of people um, had to do things that weren't in their job um, spec and for which they were technically getting paid. In fact, many people did lots of things that weren't getting paid um, at all. I, I mean, during the pandemic, have fire officers been more busy or less busy than, than usual? Um, I, I think at the start of the pandemic... Uh, when the country was in lockdown, uh, I would say the Fire and Rescue Service was less busy operationally uh, because of the consequence of people being at home, away from the workplace, not travelling on the roads uh, and the like. Um, So less busy. Also, um, some of the activity that Fire and Rescue Service and firefighters would carry out on a day-to-day basis 
uh, working in the homes of vulnerable people, carrying out inspections of high risk uh, businesses in terms of the fire safety in those buildings. Um, a lot of that work was paused. Uh, and it was paused on the back of government advice clearly around the spread of the pandemic, not just into communities, but also in terms of protecting the integrity of our own workforce and maintaining our operational response cover. So initially it was less busy, but then it returned to what I would consider to be more normal levels. OK, so basically the FBU were not making that advice on the basis that they were, the fire officers were far too uh, busy, quite the reverse. No. It was entirely because it didn't come on the, the list and they weren't getting paid um, for it, which seems... Um, slightly stubborn to say the, the, the least. O, o, just in general terms of, of working, I believe um, overall services in between 2011 and 2019 that the Watt force has reduced by about 21%. Um, the number of incidents attended has fallen by 17%. And presumably that's because we have fewer fires these, these days because people take precautions, because electrical equipment is, is safer. Um, uh, so, actually, attending fires is very minority activity of a fire officer um, uh, these these days. Um, have those cuts in workforce been proportionate to be able to deal with the level of demand, or are they being increasingly stretched? For any of our witnesses, I'd like to address. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go first. So, um, I think uh, the fire service um, is is resourced and provided on the basis of risk. Uh, and demand is an element of the consideration, but, it, but it's equally, it's about the risk that exists in local communities and there's a process that services will go through to carry out their risk management plans and then resource their service accordingly. Um, I think the reduction in the workforce um, to an extent has been reflective of the change in the number of incidents that we respond to. But as, as you rightly say, that's a small proportion of what firefighters do in a modern fire and rescue service. They're out working in local communities. Uh, they're looking at the fire safety of higher risk buildings. Uh, we are a training organisation, so there's a lot of training to prepare for the sorts of incidents that we attend. Um, so a firefighter is still busy um, doing all of that stuff. Um, in terms of um, your, your, your other point about has, has it stretched too far, I think as I said in my opening remarks, um, certainly the reduction has led to some innovation, some creativity around how the Fire and Rescue Service is provided, uh, but I think it would be remiss that every Chief Forest in the country would recognise that um, through the changes that have taken place over the last 10 years, the Fire Service has become less resilient. Um, as a consequence of that um, and uh, where we have seen some investment in the fire and rescue service and I'll use <coughs> protection officers as a good example those that carry out inspections of uh, buildings in the first round of inspections through Sir Tom and his team identified that protection activity had dropped off significantly in fire and rescue service and there was an area that needed improvement we have seen investment uh, from government uh, and from services to improve uh, those arrangements in protection and the more recent round of inspections has seen an improvement in performance. So I think where there are areas where um, additional resilience is required, investment and resource has come into those areas and we've seen an improvement as a consequence of that. Mr Wilshire? Yes, but maybe, can I just, just go back to the pandemic uh, before we move on? It, it, was a, it was a real cameo of the problems with the industrial relations and national machinery. So it started off as a flexible framework, became more and more restrictive, slower and slower. So when local services wanted to do things, it got stuck with the National Fire Brigade Union leadership and it's eventually collapsing, which, which allowed the flexibility of fire rescue services to go into vaccination. And as Mark quite rightly said, over half a million actual vaccinations administered by firefighters and fire staff, so that's fantastic. One of the things we have seen is, although there has been a reduction, and Mark's quite right about risk, is that balance in the firefighter's role between responding to fires, preventing fires, and uh, doing fire protection, so fire safety in buildings. There needs to be a much more balance around that, and in certain areas, the productivity of some firefighters. So. We have been surprised that in some services we don't see firefighters doing that on the ground prevention work, the community safety work going to people's houses. Of course, some of that was restricted by the pandemic, but either side of that, there is room for firefighters to do more of that community safety work. Following their training, following the emergency response, prevention and protection is just as important, and services need to get that balance. 
Tom, can I can I ask you to be more expansive, and as I'm sure you'd like to be in your valedictory um, remarks, more reflective and perhaps your experiences and uh, where might go. Let, let me pose a question to you. There's obviously big divergences between performances of different fire services. That's also true in, in um, constabularies, although probably the similarity of the jobs of fire officers do are are, are closer. You know, a road traffic accident in, in Sussex is no different to a road traffic accident in uh, in, in Cornwall, there may be sort of urban and rural differentials, but um, you know it's, it's a more similar job. I would have said I may be wrong. What makes for a better fire service that is rated higher under your criteria than one that's that's not? What are the factors that make for that difference? Is it just down to money? Is it down to leadership? Is it down to structures? Whatever. Um, I would. Um I would mention at least three uh, factors, uh, leadership and supervision, uh, culture and money. Um, on leadership and supervision, um, uh, there are parts of the country where leadership and supervision is of a high quality, and uh, there are other parts of the country where, frankly, it isn't uh, as good as it needs to be. That is as true a criticism that can be made of many organizations, essential public services, um, and it is no different in fire. As far as the culture is concerned, we've discussed a little bit about morale. Um, uh, there is a strong protective culture in the fire service of people eager and indeed joining the fire service in order to protect their communities and the and vulnerable people in their communities. But we've also discussed the, tox the toxicity within um, within uh, individual uh, fire and rescue services or indeed in fire stations. Um, the fire and rescue service, and this is a broad generalization, my colleagues will come in and, and uh, refine this if necessary. But broadly, one of the principal differences, many differences, but principal differences between firefighters and police officers is when firefighters turn up at your house, you're quite glad to see them. When the police turn up, sometimes you're not. And yet you're, you are in circumstances of crisis. I mean, you wouldn't have called them. They wouldn't be there if, if there were not a, 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 a crisis. So the relationship with the public, uh, as far as firefighters is concerned, should generally be much better because firefighters are seen as people who just help protect and, 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 and do not in any way uh, disturb. Um, as far as money is concerned, um, you know, public services uh, have been strained, uh, as Marcus said, uh, over the last uh, number of years. And um, of course, you know, those who pay the money, the public, through their elected representatives, want to be sure that that money is being spent wisely and well on the right things at the right times. And so, um, harking back to um, a conversation you and I had when I was here on the 27th of October, um, when we talked about uh, FMS's force management statements for the police, it is uh, my expectation that my successor and my continuing colleagues as uh, HMIs will, uh, in due time, quite soon I would expect, establish FMS's fire and rescue service management statements for fire and rescue services. The principle, if I may just take a moment on this, just a moment, uh, the principle is that every well-managed enterprise, whatever it is doing, uh, needs to understand three things. The demand it expects to face in the foreseeable future, the state of the assets that it has in order to meet that demand and how they're going to improve them, and of course the money they're going to have coming in in order to use those assets to meet that demand. Now, in terms of demand in policing, that's quite hard to, uh, to measure, but it's not impossible to measure. Um, but no measurement is going to be absolutely precise. In fire and rescue, it is a simpler, not simple, but simpler assessment as to where are the high-risk premises, where are the incidents of fires, what is the historical uh, uh, um, pattern of, 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 of the things the fire service is required to do, because, of course, it's more than putting out fires. 
As far as the assets are concerned, the principle is exactly the same. The chief fire officer needs to understand and have a, a really good appreciation of the condition, capacity, capability, serviceability, performance and security of supply of those assets and the efficiency with the highest practicable level of efficiency with which those assets can be dis deployed. And the third thing that you need to understand is how much money do I know I'm going to have or reasonably expect to have coming in. Now, the fire and rescue service and the police until recently have had year-to-year -year settlements, and that's no basis for planning. But what it will expose and does expose in policing is with that money, using these assets to the maximum practicable level of efficiency, we can't meet all future demand. So the public, through its elected representatives, has to work out, do we want to put in more money? Are we prepared to accept less demand being met or to a lower standard, standard or usually a balance? OK, so, I mean, I, I take your, your three categories, what makes the, the difference. The, the area you didn't mention in that is, is, is structure and, and, and governance. So what makes police different to fire services, uh, a police are, are, are standalone, subject now to democratic accountability through a police commissioner. Fire services are um, part of the local authority. And chief fire officers are employees of the local uh, authority and supposedly have to battle for their budget with a local authority. And I would say that chief fire officers are relatively anonymous, with the exception of um, my own in West Sussex of Dr. Sabrina Cohen-Hatton, who is something of a star within the fire service, not least because she's a um, a woman and exceedingly uh, successful at the job she's been um, doing, uh, thank goodness, in our, uh, our county. But do you think it's a weakness or a strength that effectively the fire service is just another department of the local county council having to battle for budget with libraries, with roads, uh, adult social care, whatever, whereas the police are funded directly with a budget from the, uh, from the Home Office? Yes. Um, of course, the, the police get their money also from the local precept, locally sure. raised taxes oh, as well, yeah. so they get it from broadly two sources. But yes, the governance um, pattern, the map of governance of fire and rescue uh, uh, authorities in England is a bit of a patchwork quilt. Uh, there are services that are not part of local councils, uh, and they receive their funding directly from local government settlements or from re increased rates of council tax. And then there are fire services which are part of a wider authority, such as a county council, a unitary authority, or a mayoral service, and they get their funding from the authority. They sit under, of the 44 fire and rescue services in England, 24 are combined council or metropolitan, 13 are county council, four are police, fire, and crime commissioners, and two are mayors, and of course London is, is special. So it is a very different picture in other parts of the country. I suppose what you must say is that whilst not all policing is local, all fires are local, yeah. of course, and therefore it is up to local communities to decide what the governance and funding arrangements ought to be and how much risk they're prepared to take. But there is considerable financial disparity between services um, and, and some f services appear to be really quite well funded and others are struggling to afford uh, the number of staff they think they need to meet local risk. So on that basis, are you saying that because all fires are local, you made a very good um, point, that there is a case for extending the role of the PCCs that they have the oversight of the fire service uh, universally? That case undoubtedly exists. Uh, that's a wider discussion uh, about I know it whether, exists, so what's your comment on it? Um, yeah, PF, PFCCs, um, with their own uh, powers to, uh, to you know, have a separate line on your council tax bill, uh, that, uh, that has some significant strengths and advantages to it. You're not being as um, diverse as I thought you might be on, the, on, on this. It sounds like you're not a fan of PCCs. I'm a great fan of some PCCs. <laughs> Are you a fan of the principle of the PCCs? I think it has many strengths on paper. <laughs> very political answers you're giving us here, Sir Tom. We're very disappointing. We thought you might be slightly more valedictory uh, and reckless in your comments today. Well, uh, next week I'm publishing my last state of policing <laughs> report, and you'll be able to read a bit more about that in that one. Uh, the PCC model 
I mean, democratic accountability of the police did not begin in 2012. It goes back for as long as there have been police, and even further, in fact. Um, the idea that uh, PCCs have um, a monopoly on wisdom in relation to the, um, to the affairs of the police is, is nonsense, of course. Um, and there have been instances where some PCCs, happily most of them not re-elected, um, have done the most extraordinarily stupid things. Um, the model has yet to settle down. The question for government and parliament is, do we want to give PCCs more functions when they are still in their infancy? That's a really big question. Could, could I just add to the, uh, to the government's sure. discussion as well? As, as Sir Tom said, it's, it is a complex and complicated picture with the different mm. types of governance. And so far, their inspections, we can't say to one governance area or not, that's a better form of governance. It's the type of, one of the things we have found following our inspection, West Sussex is a classic case, is more investment in the fire rescue services following our inspection to say there's need for improvement. And I know Sabrina and West Sussex have, have got quite a lot, a lot of money that way. Yeah. I think the, the telling point is the relationship between the chief fire officer and the governance structure. So as you quite rightly said, they are employees rather than operational independents. So it, it, at times there can be interference into operational matters from the governance structure. So I think one of the things uh, people would benefit was operational independence for chief fire officers and, and a bit more of an executive approach to uh, the governance so it's about holding to account and scrutiny and all those things you would expect from really good governance, whilst the, uh, within the constraints of the resources available, the chief fire officer can get on with running the service. If I may add to my earlier answer, um, uh, as, as Roy says, operational independence is, is a hot issue. Um, when a PCC takes office, uh, in relation to policing, of course, he or she has to, to make, um, uh, swear an oath of office. And the last line of that is, I will not interfere with the operational independence of the mm -hmm. chief constable. Now, that undoubtedly uh, ought to be applied uh, equally when a PFCC, you know, when, when they take on fire, that they should do the same in relation to that because operational independence is of enormous importance. I think that would be a very great advantage of the PFCC taking over Fire. The other thing I wanted to just clarify is that um, I think that, um, uh, to just add to what I said earlier, is uh, I'm not against the PCC model. I think it has very significant strengths and very significant advantages over the police authority model. I'd like also to emphasize that I think some PCCs have done an absolutely exemplary job. And I think that the new crop of PCCs uh, who have come in, and we've seen an almost 50% turnover of PCCs in the last elections. Um, and I don't wish to be taken in any way that I don't intend. Um, I, uh, I think that um, there is a, and we don't inspect PCCs, but there is obviously a very significant improvement in the, the professionalism and the approach of the new round of PCCs, building on and, in, and intensifying uh, the quality of the PCCs who are still there. Thank you. Thank you. Diane Abbott. Oh, thank you, Chair. I wanted to ask a, a, a quite a simple question, really. Um, I was born in the 1950s into a working-class West Indian family, and everyone in those days had paraffin heaters. So there was no such thing as central heating in working-class houses in the 50s. And paraffin heaters being knocked over caused an awful lot of fires. Now, people don't have paraffin heaters nowadays. So tell me, this may be one for Mr Haddingham, what is the main cause of domestic fires nowadays? If you look at, I mean, overall, the number of domestic fires has come down significantly over the last 10 years. Uh, most fires start in the kitchen or come from some sort of electrical cause. Um, so um, when we when we carry out um, oh, and it, it, so th those are the most those are the causes. I think it's also about the vulnerability of the person. Um, so when we see people who are um, sadly killed or seriously injured in fires, particularly fires in the home, there is more often than not a degree of vulnerability about the person as well. And that might be linked into the age of the person. It might be linked into the um, 
the uh, illness or multiple illnesses that a person has. It might be linked into the fact that the person is isolated and lives at home. There might be issues associated with drink and drugs. Uh, there might be issues associated with mental health and issues like that. So a lot of the issues are around vulnerability of the person, which are attrib attributable to the cause. Uh, but then the link to that is often around uh, electricity causes or fires in the kitchen. Um, and you're right. Um, increasingly, and, and I think this is, is important where the fire service is looking forward, um, and I think if we all looked in our own homes today, compared to looking in our own homes a number of years ago, the number of electrical items in our homes and the places where we source some of those electrical items from uh, is significantly different to what it was 10 years ago. In my own home, there is probably hardly a plug socket that's not got a plug in it charging something um, and in my previous role in the county council when I was chief forester in a county council service I also had responsibility for trading standards uh, and in that role we often looked at actually the quality um, of the sort of equipment that was being provided into homes which was often linked into the causes of fires if people were buying things off of the internet or elsewhere uh, which wasn't appropriate or safe uh, to be used. Thank you very much that that was to coin a phrase, very illuminating. Um, I just wanted to get back to uh, Mr Windsor. I was really struck by the poor relationship you seem to have with trade unions. Um, it's, it's, it's unusually bad, really, in terms of people in your role coming before select committees. Do you think there's a particular reason for it, or is it just that you think the FBU is particularly difficult? Did you say a cool relationship? Cool. cool relationship. I think poor, did poor, you say think, poor? Oh, poor, I'm so sorry. Yeah, poor. Yeah, pretty much means the same thing. Yeah. A yeah. poor <laughs> relationship with trade unions. I'm a member of a trade union, um, so I don't have a poor relationship with trade unions. Um, I, um, I was a member of the Labour Party for 30 years. I quit in 20, 2006. Um, uh, trade unions have... Uh, achieved a vast amount of uh, things, uh, improvements in relation to the terms and conditions of their members. So now I'm a great fan of trade unions. It's how they behave. And if they prevent people or they try to prevent people uh, or, or their members doing the things that their members want, for example, marauding terrorist attacks or vaccinations, then I'm against what they do. I'm not against trade unions. Far, far from it. Okay, uh, Mr. Haddingham, you, you touched on the lack of gender and race diversity in the fire service. What exactly are you doing to redress that? Lots, lots of things we're doing, and, and I'll, I'll reflect on what we're doing as a National Fire Chiefs Council at the moment. Um, so one of the things that the National Fire Chiefs Council does is it has a number of programmes of work in place where we produce products and guidance and support to fire and rescue services across the country. And one of those programmes of work led by my Chief Fire Officer colleague Anne Millington uh, in Kent Fire and Rescue Service uh, is called the People Programme. And there are a number of projects attached to the People Programme. Uh, and an element of that is a work stream led by um, Catherine Billings um, in the future and Alex Johnson, who are chiefs in South Yorkshire and Cornwall Fire Service, focused around equality, diversity and inclusion. So if I just sort of go through quickly some of those projects. So um, we, are, um, we are creating leadership programmes across the Fire and Rescue Service for supervisory, middle, and there is a senior leadership programme in place for the Fire and Rescue Service, and equality and inclusion is woven into the fabric uh, of those leadership programmes. Um, we um, have developed a number of what we call uh, equal access statements, uh, which is about providing these statements for fire and rescue services to support the way in which they engage uh, with communities across their counties. Um, so to give you an example, there are statements for engaging with people from neurodiverse communities, uh, for engaging with people from LGBT communities uh, and from black communities as well. And there are about seven or other statements as well. Um, there are a number of, um, uh, we're developing a recruitment website um, and uh, that recruitment website will have a strong focus around equality and inclusion uh, and there are a number of aids to fire and rescue service to enable them to support their own recruitment programs uh, within that. 
Um, as we touched on earlier, we've also developed um, the fire standard around the core code of ethics in the Fire and Rescue Service, which sets out the basis upon which you can develop the culture in your Fire and Rescue Service. And there's lots of guidance that we produce and training events and CPD events that fire services across the country can engage with um, to support um, how they provide this in their own fire and rescue service. So there's a range of things we're doing. I think what I would say um, is that um, at the moment, from, a, um, from the perspective of diversity and the number of female or number of firefighters who come from uh, minority ethnic communities, then uh, we're not seeing the outcomes yet that we want to see. And as I said earlier, a more diverse workforce will create a better fire and rescue service and a more diverse workforce right throughout the fire and rescue service, not just at firefighter level, up to and including chief fire officer level. So we've put some work in place um, and our job now is to maintain the momentum around that and continue that for years to come until, um, well, I'm not sure we'll ever reach a, a position where we're entirely satisfied with where we are. I listened very carefully to what you said, and in my experience when it comes to diversity, it's very easy to get the diversity, as it were, jargon off part, and it's very easy to set up committees and programmes and all the rest of it. But getting concrete outcomes year on year is much harder First of all, can you remind me, you may have said, but what proportion of the fire service is ethnic minority and or female? And secondly, how do you set yourself targets to increase recruitment year on year? Yep. So the proportion of the fire and rescue service, or the proportion of firefighters um, from a, um, ethnic minority is 4.7% at the moment and if you go back 10 years ago um, then that was at 3.5 percent so there's been some improvement but not enough um, if you look at the number of female firefighters um, the current uh, figure is 7.5 percent and if you go back 10 years ago uh, that was 4.1 percent so again we've seen some improvement but not enough um, in terms of have targets been set uh, for the fire and rescue service or within the fire and rescue service we haven't set targets um, having said that, there is a, a strong ambition. I mean, only yesterday uh, I was at an induction event, leading an induction event with new members of the National Fire Chiefs Council, 50 of my senior colleagues across the country, uh, and we were talking with Wayne Brown as the Deputy Chief Forest of the West Mids about how do you create a more inclusive environment in the Fire and Rescue Service. I met with my senior Chief Fire Officer colleagues from across the UK last week at the London Fire Brigade headquarters and Anne Millington led a discussion around equality, diversity and inclusion. So uh, I, I suppose what I would say is, rest assured, this is a significant area of attention for the Fire and Rescue Service and we're determined to see better outcomes than what we've seen so far, um, both in terms of recruitment but also, as I said earlier, about having the right inclusive environment in the Fire and Rescue Service once we recruit people in, so we retain people and all of those people are able to realise their full potential, whatever they want that to be in the fire and rescue service, in the role they carry out up to and including being future chief fire officers. I could ask how many black people are in those meetings but I won't. I want to move on to the report against your 2020 equality, diversity and inclusion strategy, strategic improvement plan. In the improvement plan you promise an equality, diversity and inclusion annual report. Have you produced one? Um, as, as the National Fire Chiefs Council. Mm. Um, so I, I haven't got it to hand with me. Um, I would have to go away, Chairman, and have a look and, and see when the last annual report was and provide it to the committee where there has been one. Yeah, have, are you saying you're not sure whether there's been an annual report? I'm not sure if there is an annual report. No, we've got a, we've got a strategy, a number of work streams, work streams that sit on the back of it. Uh, I'm not aware, and in my tenure as the NFCC chair, we haven't produced an annual report around equality and inclusion from an NFCC perspective. So you didn't meet the promise in the improvement plan? Uh, if there's not an annual report, then, then no, we haven't. OK, just moving on. As a colleague said earlier, the culture in the Fire and Rescue Services has been described as toxic. Um, you spoke about the code of ethics that you've introduced, but you know, when you're trying to change the culture of an organisation, if you've got the, the self-same management in, in position that presided over the old culture, it's often difficult to change the culture. 
Apart from codes and meetings and so on, do you have any other ideas about changing the culture in the fire and rescue survey? Um, I, I'll draw from my experiences of having been a chief forester in Suffolk um, for eight years before I came into this role. Uh, and my experience is, if, if you want to change the culture of the organisation as the most senior leader in the organisation, then you personally need to lead it. And yes, you do need to have um, a strategy, you do need to have a plan, you do need to have objectives that you've set, and you do need to take on board National Fire Chiefs Council products and things like that. But it's a very personal thing. Um, it involves you as a senior leader committing the time and the energy to live by the values and cultures that you want in the organisation and then to spend time out in the workforce talking about that at length and in detail with colleagues right across the Fire and Rescue Service. Um, that's what I did when I was in Suffolk Fire and Rescue Service and was inspected against that by colleagues um, and that's what I know a lot of my colleagues across the country are doing to improve the culture in their organisations, accepting that there are services where the inspectorate and also senior leadership teams are dealing with cultures that they're not happy with in their organisation um, as well. And when I say their organisation, um, they would be the first to say that they are as senior leaders, of course, a critical part of that organisation. It's not something they're talking about that is separate from them. They are the senior leaders. It is their organisation of which they are part. Thank you very much. Sir Thomas, have you got anything further to say on the culture and on diversity issues? Um, of course, there is a long way to go. Um, but the hardest thing to do in leadership and management is to change the culture of an organisation. There's yeah. nothing harder than that. You know, culture is how we behave when no one else is looking. Um, it's a hard, hard job to do. But um, these public services, both the police and the, and the fire and rescue service, in their leadership, take that very, very seriously indeed. Thank you. Could, could I just add to uh, the, some of the things, that, yeah, the solid uh, things, examples, things we, we see. There, there are, as Mark quite rightly says, the, the intentions there, the strategic plans are there. It's when you get further into the workforce. So equality training not being optional. It should be you know, compulsory. So we've been to services where it's optional. Uh, performance management and individual performance plans, so people performance that manage properly. Proper community engagement, and I know there's lots of work, but more thing. But it's very important to take your existing workforce with you as well. If you're doing engagement, you're trying to recruit particular communities to the service. The workforce needs to understand that would improve the service and bring greater talent. So there's, so there's a number of things that could be practical in terms of performance management, training, uh, outreach work, and recruitment. That I think all services could could learn from. Thank you. Could I just um, ask a question from the inspectorate? Do you think there should be targets around gender and ethnicity for the fire and rescue service? Because I'm a little bit taken aback that there aren't targets and there's no... We all accept that this is not acceptable. We want, we want things to be better. But would targets... Is that what the inspectorate think we should have? Um, there is always a case for targets, but of course, uh, you know, the old saw is you set a target and you miss the point. In other words, something else gets neglected. We have seen a target culture in policing produce uh, very significantly adverse consequences because the target gets aimed at and other things get neglected. However, I think the case uh, for uh, targets uh, or appropriate me measures uh, in relation to um, equality, diversity, and inclusion, I think the case for that is much, much stronger. So, you, as an inspector, you would call for that? Um, we'll have to give that some thought. Uh, it is really a matter for uh, the government as to, and the local authorities in question as to whether or not they wish to set their own targets. Of course, the, the inspector would then have to assess whether or not the targets are A, the right targets, and B, whether or not they're creating perverse results. So it would not be for the inspectorate to set targets. Okay. You, and, I mean, there's a white paper that's been referred to a number of times. Is your expectation that there will be something in the white paper around inclusivity, diversity? We, we're thinking that's the case. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it will come across very clearly in the white paper, yes. Right, OK. okay. Um, Can I just ask what, why you think there is such a problem with attracting BME <laughs> candidates? I mean, Sir Tom, you said that... When, when a fire officer turns up at your home, they are 
welcomed and probably fire officers of all the, without trying to discriminate, of all the emergency services are seen as the sort of the heroes. So why wouldn't people from a BME background want to be seen as something who's actually uh, fated uh, amongst society? What, what is going wrong? Yeah. Sorry, I think there's a number of said, you know, uh, I spent 40 years in the fire service and it's something we've been thinking about for, for a long time. I think there's a number of things in there. Uh, the, the, the phrase, you can't be what you can't see, it comes to mind. So you, it, the actual reflect in the community you're working. So they might still be welcomed across the door, still be working into homes, talked to, but, you know, people don't think they can be that. So you, you can't be what you, you can't see. Uh, I, I think it's a really well-kept secret to Fire and Rescue Service, just how diverse the work is. So people will think it is you have to be big and strong and break doors down all the time. No, so that's yeah, a bit of a myth we need to get through. But there are BME people who are big and strong and yeah, can break doors down just as much as anybody else. A, absolutely. But again, it's that reflection. That, you know, and I think uh, Wayne Brown, who ha is Afro-Caribbean descent, um, Mark talked about earlier, he uses that phrase quite a lot, and you, you can't be what you can't see. So it's um, one of those vicious circles. You need more people to join so people can see more people, and we need to, to work with them. 40 years, you say, to, to deal with that vicious um, circle. I mean, the police, there is a problem because of perceived, I make no uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, responses towards more stop and search for, for people who tend to come from black background or, or, or whatever, there is no such perception amongst the fire service. You know, they don't choose to turn up to a road traffic accident because it's been driven by a, a, a person who happens to be black rather than white. I mean, there aren't those sort of potential perception barriers for people coming forward saying, yeah, I'd love to be a fire officer. What is it? I just don't understand. I, I, so so I, I think, I think it's, a, it's a fascinating debate and the debates have been had uh, many, many times, and I think it's difficult to grasp exactly what it is, and I think it's a number of things. I think we, we touched earlier around the reputation that the fire service has uh, in local communities, uh, and I, I think there's a risk of some complacency in there, because I think in general terms the fire service has a very good reputation in communities, but I, would, I think it will be different in different communities, um, because uh, in, in predominantly white communities, I think the fire service has a very good reputation because what, what the white community see is a fire and rescue service that represents them. I think in other communities, I don't think always, um, they see a fire and rescue service that represents, looks like or sounds like them. So I think there is some, some challenge there in terms of how do you then attract people to come and join an organisation. I, you know, I don't buy that. You no, don't, you don't, don't, ring, up and you don't yeah. not ring up and report a fire because you might not get a black fire officer arriving because they don't take it seriously. I, do, I just don't buy that. And I What's think you're, he you're hearing from the committee that we are particularly concerned yeah. <laughs> about this. And as Tim has just said, and as Tim Lance just said, that this has been an issue for decades mm -hmm. and has not been properly addressed. I, I am going to move on to, to Paula Barker now, and then I want to ask some questions about Grenfell before we complete this part. Yeah, so thank you. I mean, just just a comment before I move on to my question. I mean, Mr. Wilshire, you you. The comment you made, you've, you were a firefighter or in the firefighter for 40 years and, and you've been thinking about it for a long t time. I mean, perhaps that's what one of the issues is. Rather than just think about it, perhaps you just need to get on and do it. Um, you know, perhaps there should be active campaigns about recruitment. Um, I, I'm literally astounded and I think the white paper... Um, when it comes, must include equality and diversity. But it is about recruitment and retention that I'd just like to touch on as well, um, because I would be interested to understand um, your reflections and thoughts. Um, in 2021, there were just over 35,000 uh, firefighters nationally, of which 35% were on-call firefighters. Um, so obviously that's a significant amount. In, but in urban centres like Merseyside and Greater Manchester, for example, they've rejected the on-call model. Um, but nearby Cheshire, for example, uh, do rely heavily uh, with on-call firefighters in the more rural locations. Um, so my question is, um, one, is the model fit for purpose? And secondly, I am hearing that problems do exist in those services that are more reliant 
uh, on on-call firefighters. Um, so, uh, in respect of recruitment and retention, yeah. so I'd be interested to uh, hear your thoughts on that, please. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um Recruitment and retention of on-call firefighters was an issue I dealt with for 10 years in Suffolk. Uh, Suffolk has 35 fire stations, 29 of those are on-call only fire stations and the other six fire stations have got at least one on-call fire engine on those stations. So it was the heart of the organisation that I led for 11 years. Um, so on-call firefighters do a fantastic job in their local communities um, and more broadly across the county in which they, they serve. Um, but there are challenges to the system. Um, in terms of a, a duty system that is resilient at night, when the majority of those on-call firefighters are at home, so within five minutes of their on-call fire station, it is a really resilient and effective duty system. At the weekend, when a good proportion of them are close to their fire station, doing whatever they do at the weekend or when they're not at work, then it's a good duty system. During the week, when people are at work, and people who are on-call firefighters have other jobs as well, and that job is often not anymore in the local community, in rural communities, they have to travel further afield. And if they're not within five, six, seven minutes of the fire station, they are not available as a firefighter because it takes too long to get to the fire station. So during the week, uh, during the daytime, it is a more difficult duty system. So, uh, and also the expectations of an on-call firefighter are significant. So I expect an on-call firefighter in the terms and conditions are they will be available for up to 120 hours a week. So that's five 24-hour periods every week they'll be available. And available means within five, six, seven minutes of their local fire station. Um, and for that, um, they take a financial um, benefit of about £6,000 a year, something like that of which alongside their primary employment, of course, they pay tax and national insurance. So they're not getting much financial reward. Most of them don't do it for the money. Um, they do it for their commitment to their local community. Um, it requires primary employers. So if they work for a primary employer, particularly if they're going to be available whilst they're at work for their primary employer, it requires a fire service to have excellent relationships with the primary employer to be able to release that person when their pager goes off to just walk out of their primary employment, run out of their primary employment, to get to the fire station to respond to the incident. So it's a significant role, but it's a really important role for rural fire and rescue services. In terms of what, what could we do, there's an awful lot fire services are doing. So in terms of recruitment, and we've touched on um, recruiting from a broader range, so from um, a gender perspective and also from a uh, different communities perspective as well. And there's a lot of work that goes on around positive action to encourage people to come into on-call roles from those communities. Uh, there's a lot of services do around uh, making sure the fire and rescue service is as good a place as it can be for when you do come in, you want to stay, so you feel like you're well looked after as an on-call firefighter and you do a job where you feel you add value into the local community. I do think there are there is more we need to do because it is a system uh, that's been around for 50, 60 years and it does need more resilience and more investment and improving in the future. And indeed, we've had conversations with, with government several times around um, tax incentives for individuals, tax incentives for primary employers, and other ways which we can create um, a, um, a more attractive environment for people to release people to be on-call firefighters or come in and stay in on-call firefighter uh, roles. So that's another uh, issue that needs to be addressed in the white paper. Uh, I, I would expect it probably will be picked up in the white paper because certainly colleagues in the inspectorate have raised it as an area as well. Right, OK, so these are Just things... Yes. Really quickly, yep. you, tr you try to make out that part of the problem why you don't have more black firefighters is the way they regard the fire service. And what I would say is this, that the black community's relationship with the police force is, how can I put this, mixed. But I would say that amongst the black community, or the Asian community for that matter, the respect and the admiration with which they hold the fire service is as great as any other part of the community. So you have to look at yourselves rather than saying we don't, we don't identify or we don't, we don't like. I just wanted to say... Okay, thank you. I just want to ask a couple of questions about Grenfell and about the changes that have been introduced post Grenfell and whether, um, as the, um, the, the head, the chair of the National um, 
Fire Chiefs Council whether you believe now those changes that have been introduced go far enough that means that we will not face the situation we had at Grenfell ever again. And then I'd like to ask Sir Tom a question about the number of fire inspectors that we have. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pick um, a couple of areas because I think there are, there are so many um, considerations around the learning that's come from the tragedy at Grenfell. Um, and I'll pick two. One, one I would touch on is the, the built environment. Uh, and then secondly, uh, the way that the Fire and Rescue Service deals with fires in tall buildings. Um, so in terms of the built environment, there's, there is a significant amount of work, and I've sat previously in select committees talking about this, in terms of the role of the National Fire Chiefs Council and the role of the Fire and Rescue Service uh, with government and the wider um, industries around fire safety in the built environment to talk about the sorts of improvements that are required, whether it is um, external wall systems on, on uh, high-rise residential buildings or actually all of the other issues associated with fire safety in the built environment that have been exposed uh, through the public inquiry, uh, through Dame Judith Hackett's report uh, and through the work of colleagues in government around the Building Safety Programme, Building Safety Bill, Fire Safety Act uh, and the likes. So uh, my, my view on that is that the, the fire, there's a lot the Fire and Rescue Service have done because we've looked at ourselves in terms of our role as regulators in that built environment um, and we have um, revisited our competency-based framework for our inspecting officers. We've created a system of third-party accreditation for our inspecting officers, of which we have about a thousand. Um, and we now work closely with the local authority building control about a system of CPD. So there are some changes that we've made internally within the Fire and Rescue Service about what we do. Um, we're also um, strongly of the view that the system that creates the built environment, as Dame Judith Hackett described, was the worst example of systemic failure she'd ever seen. Uh, and I think that's true from what I've seen. Um, and I think there is still some way to go before that system uh, is in a position where we can have confidence about the quality of the existing built environment and how it's maintained, but also uh, some assurance about new buildings as they are built in accordance with the regulations with the right competency and culture of those who work in the system. Uh, the second piece in terms of um, our operational response to fires in tall buildings, uh, I think the, there are all of the recommendations that have come out of the Grenfell inquiry so far, and the National Fire Chiefs Council um, has a role uh, in terms of supporting every fire and rescue service across the country in how they're implementing uh, the recommendations that are relevant for the fire and rescue service. Uh, and I attend, um, along with a colleague in, in the inspectorate and Andy Rowe from the London Fire Brigade, the ministerial board around the Grenfell recommendations to provide some assurance about the progress that's being made uh, and the outcome of the reports that we do with fire services are published on the Fire England site uh, by the Home Office in terms of progress that's made. So how we deal with fires in tall buildings uh, is different now in terms of what it was five years ago in terms of how do 999 fire control operators handle the calls, deal with fire survival guidance uh, to the process that firefighters will go through in terms of training and development and how they, um, how they apply that to deal with um, fires in buildings. Coming back, I, th I think it would be remiss of me not to comment on the, to provide assurance this will never happen again. Um, I think that would be a big step because I think there are, like any tragedy that takes place, it's never one thing that causes the tragedy. There are a number of events that come together in a terrible way that lead to the tragedy. So I, I don't think I could provide assurance that an incident of that nature would never happen again, but I can provide assurance that we won't rest. As there's work, work in progress, there's more to do, yes. and the fire and rescue services around the country are currently implementing the recommendations so far, yes. but they haven't, that's not complete yet. That's not, that's not no. complete yet, no. Okay. I just wanted to ask Sir Tom um, about the comment that you made. Um, it will be some time before the numbers of fire safety inspectors reach the numbers required in England. So I just wondered what, what risk that, that's posing then uh, if we don't have those numbers. To the public. It is an increased risk, but I'd, I'd defer to um, right. Roy Wilshire. 
Yeah, thank you. So uh, that's correct. One of the things I talked about earlier was the balance between response, protection, prevention. And I think that balance over a number of years got a little bit out of kilter with concentration of response uh, to the detriment of fire protection and the number of fire safety officers. It's um, one of the things we pointed out in our early reports. But I'm pleased to say that with some government investment and more investment and balance through fire rescue services, the numbers are increasing. We are seeing more fire safety inspectors. The difficulty with that is it takes some time to train a fire safety inspector. There's not a ready number of inspectors out there. They need to be brought into the service or from the service and trained. Um, the other difficulty fire and rescue services is facing that there's uh, a lot of call for the, that expertise to go into private industry. You can often pay more. So it's almost uh, a never ending circle of recruiting, training, getting competent fire safety inspectors who then can go and earn money elsewhere so um so it is, it is an improving picture there's more balance there are more fire safety inspectors their risk-based inspection programs are increasing uh, but that needs to be sustainable and that's our fear that it won't be sustained over a long time when will we have enough inspectors well it, enough i think uh we we I mean, are what date what date's the aim it, well, is there a target uh, there's not a target, there's no. not a target, there, okay. but there's uh, an increase, um, and as I say, with the training, it's, we're probably two or three years away from having the number we'd expect. Two or three years away. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I just ask how long it takes to train? Um, well, it, 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 a lot of it depends on what level. So we go from the, the apprentice inspector right to a fire engineer. So to be a fire engineer is probably five to seven years. So to be a competent inspecting officer, probably around two years. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right. I think thank you very much for your um, answers to our questions about the Fire and Rescue Service. We now just want to turn in the last part of the session to discuss uh, the police in light of recent events and also the fact that Sir Tom's coming to the end of his uh, tenure as the Chief Inspector for Constabulary as well as Fire and Rescue. Um, and I just wondered, Sir Tom, um, Tim Loughton's already said about um, your valedictory remarks to this committee and whether you would like to comment on the current state of policing and your feelings about whether policing is in a better state at the end of your tenure as a Chief Inspector than when you began. Well, the answer to the latter question is undoubtedly yes, but I'll explain <laughs> why. Um, I think that the most important thing to say is that police reform um, is, uh, you know, there's been more police reform in the last 10 years than there have been in the last 100 years since the Desborough Report in 1920 and the Police Act 1919 after the strikes. Um, and next week on uh, the 10th of March, I'll be publishing my ninth and last state of policing report. It will come to all members of the committee. Of course, um, I'll come back and talk to you about it if you really want me to. I'd love to. Um, and I say quite a lot about it because it's a nine-year, ten-year look back as well as, of course, a look forward. But although the police service has undergone a great deal of reform, there's one thing that is no, in no need of reform, and that's the bravery of police officers who don't know what they're going to face every single day. Um, and the culture and the, the qualities that are required to be a good police officer are very clear. They are courage, uh, self-restraint, the ability to talk to people, empathy, professionalism, intelligence, the commitment to help people, and of course the commitment <coughs> to prevent, to keep people safe by preventing crime and disrupting uh, criminal networks and criminal behaviour. Um, the culture in policing is, is strong, but recent events, uh, Sarah Everard's murder, um, the photographs of the two dead uh, ladies, um, what was revealed in Charing Cross Police Station, which is not confined to Charing Cross, um, those are very serious um, incidents which have shaken uh, public confidence in the police but it has not, they have not destroyed public confidence in the police. Um, they are uh, the subject of a number of inquiries and investigations. Uh, we, the inspectorate, have been commissioned to look into the vetting and other aspects of 
of policing and uh, as a result of these things um, we were commissioned to inspect the uh, response, uh, the, the conduct uh, by the Metropolitan Police of the Vigil in Clapham Common after Sarah Everard's murder. Um, so those are um, important um, considerations, but no reform to their courage and their bravery. The vast, vast majority of police officers are absolutely furious at what has been recently revealed. There are, of course, controversies over the um, the loss of the um, uh, Metropolitan Police Commissioner, which you may want me to talk about, um, and you may want me to reflect on the other aspects where I think policing has got better. Uh, I think you have. Um, but broadly, I think the competence of uh, police forces in understanding future demand and understanding what it takes to ensure that they're well prepared for the future uh, as crime and disorder changes in its, both its techniques and its nature, um, I think that uh, that um, forces have taken uh, very considerable steps uh, in the right direction in that respect. Um, their sensitivity to the needs of their police officers, both mental health and physical well-being, I think are important and, and, and extremely valuable. Um, but I do think that uh, the march of technology is... is uh, with some exceptions, leaving the police behind, the gap between what the police can do and what um, uh, those who will do us harm can do and are doing uh, may very well be widening. And uh, the failures of the police to um, invest, and that's a function of you know, public policy as well as anything else, um, are, are just making people uh, more at risk of fraud and other means of committing offences. You know, children are more at risk in their bedrooms than they are out on street corners, for example. Um, I, uh, I've made some remarks about the local accountability model, which has real strengths but is in need of reform. I would say that the 43 force model in England and Wales is now broken. Um, it does not work as it should. Um, it uh, was uh, provided for in 1962, implemented in 1974. That's a long time ago, and not all policing is local. Um, I would say that the failures of public services to do their part is, uh, is imposing a significant additional and unnecessary demand on the police. The police service is the service uh, which will never say no, um, but failures in, um, in education, in housing, in social policy, social services, and of course mental health, particularly child and adolescent mental health, those are putting undue demands on the police and that needs to be dealt with. I think that the state of the children's uh, ch child and adolescent mental health services is a national disgrace and it is necessary for public policy makers to fix that. Um, it is, uh, to quote Frederick, Frederick Douglass, it is easier to build, um, sorry, it is easier uh, to build strong children than to fix broken men. And that is what happens. Um, and the other observation I would make is that the criminal justice system is on its knees. Well, thank you for that um, assessment. Can I just take you back to a comment you made there about the 43 police force um, forces model being, um, I think, broken, and wrap that up, actually, with your earlier comment about the Metropolitan Police and about the departure of the Commissioner. Could you just say something about what your thoughts are about what model should be employed <coughs> and whether the Metropolitan Police Force is just too big and has too much to do? Um, the local accountability model, um, as we've already discussed, I won't repeat, um, has significant strengths but is in need of reform. The local accountability model in London is unique because the Commissioner of the Met is looking in two directions. Uh, she or he is held to account under the Police Reform and Social Responsibility Act 2011 uh, by the Mayor and by the Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime, um, but uh, the Commissioner is also 
not only appointed by and may be removed by the Home Secretary, but also has national responsibilities, uh, as well as capital city responsibilities, which are of special importance uh, to the Home Secretary. So when the Mayor and the Home Secretary see life differently, as they do at the moment, that puts the Commissioner in uh, an, an awkward position. And um, that is a matter of local accountability, which I think is in need of some examination. And can you say something about the the model, the 43 police force model? What do you, what's your view about how that should be changed? Because I remember years ago there was a, a debate about whether that we should have fewer police forces covering bigger areas. And of course in Scotland we have just one national police force in Scotland. So what, do you have a view? I do. Um, and I'll be saying more about it on the 10th of March. Um, and I said quite a lot about it in my previous state of policing reports. There are not 43 best ways of doing the same thing. Um, and um, because criminality um, and vulnerability cross police force borders, police forces need to be much, much better at cooperating with one another. I don't think there's a case for a national police force. Um, I think that the need is for the collaboration between police forces, especially in the acquisition and use of information and communication technologies and the flow of information and intelligence across police force boundaries, that is in need of significant reform. I've made a number of remarks in that respect in relation to the creation of a network code for the police, which mirrors the network codes in the other essential safety critical monopoly of uh, public services. Uh, I have drafted one and I hope to get it out before the end of the month. Can I um, just come back to, to mindset, which you quite rightly said is the, the biggest challenge for any leader to, to, to change. And the three examples you just mentioned of problems being Sarah Everard um, murder, um, the extraordinary way police officers publicised photographs of the two um, young women who were uh, murdered, and then Charing Cross... The first was clearly down to a, an evil person, however we want to um, uh, define that, although the question marks as to how his behaviour might have been overlooked by, um, by, by colleagues, but it's primarily down to that individual. You could say the same applied to um, the, the second, although the fact that they seemed to think it was a good thing to publicise amongst their social um, network is, uh, is obviously worrying. But the third one was absolutely a mindset of colleagues thinking it was absolutely acceptable and amusing um, to brag about how misogynistic they uh, were or racist they were or, um, or whatever um, amongst a, you know, a, a not small circle of, of colleagues and potentially a wider circle of colleagues if, if they thought there was the, the traction um, uh, for it. That's deeply worrying, isn't it? Out of all of those things, wouldn't you identify, although it didn't obviously involve a, a murder, but in terms of the mindset of professional police officers who we look to protect us against misogynistic abuse, racist abuse, as well as uh, criminal activity at, uh, at large, for officers in a mainstream London police station to think it's normal practice to brag and banter about those sorts of things is deeply worrying as to the sort of people we're allowing into the police force, is it not? I um, agree, yes. I'm sorry, uh, I don't think anybody would defend, indeed they won't defend, what they wrote on their social media messages, uh, etc. Um, I think it is remarkable that anybody would think it safe, let alone acceptable, to write down those things, because when you commit it to writing, you're creating a permanent record of the communication. So you wonder about their basic intelligence and common sense. Um, I don't know the ages of the officers in question and when they were recruited, but clearly the, the communications in question were just disgraceful and appalling. Um, it is, you know, when police officers um, uh, are joining the police, and I made this point in last year's State of Policing report as well, it is incumbent upon the police when they are assessing these candidates. Now, a lot more people want to join the police than get in, so they've got a wide range of people to choose from. But when they are assessing these candidates, they need to have good techniques to recognise 
characteristics and behaviours which are inconsistent with the office of constable, a fondness for violence, a fondness for the exercise of power over their fellow citizens, uh, homophobia, misogyny, racial uh, um, attitudes, etc. Um, when those things are recognised, the police should root them out and throw them out under Regulation 13 of the Police Conduct Regulations. They should not allow them to stay in the police or to get into the police. And in too many respects, the attitude, well, he'll make a good officer, will knock these uh, rough edges off him, it could be her, but knock these rough edges off, um, is, is a disastrous policy. Now, it costs a lot of money to train a police officer, and forces will be reluctant to abandon that investment by throwing out somebody like that. But they must, because otherwise they're storing up what could be a 30-year problem, as we may have seen in the case of Charing Cross. Now, I don't want to preempt because I can't, uh, what the Independent Office of Police Conduct and the other investigations into that uh, will reveal. We have been given a commission by the Home Secretary in relation to the quality of vetting and professionalism, etc., in relation to the police, so I won't say more about that because we don't talk about inspections once they're going on. We will be publishing uh, relatively soon in relation to that. Uh, but I share your view that uh, these attitudes um, are entirely inconsistent with the office of constable. So all of the things are indeed the inconsistent with the attitudes of any decent human being. All, all of the things you've said um, should not be happening, must not happen, and we, all of us, I'm sure, will entirely incur, concur uh, with that. But you've said that over nine years the quality of the police is undoubtedly much better. That seems to undermine hugely the fact that the police are much better. The police may be much better in terms of detection rates, although I think they're not. Certainly not in terms of reporting and ending up in prosecution of uh, violence against um, uh, women and, and the girls, for example. Mm -hmm. Detecting terrorism, probably they are much better. We won't know the full details of that for obvious um, uh, reasons. But to be employing a not insignificant number of officers whose um, very targets seem to be the sort of inclusive targets that we're trying to get into the police force, let alone the fire service, whose record's even worse, as we've already um, heard. The fact that they are still there, the fact that they were recruited uh, in the first place, um, suggests something is going very wrong. And you yourself, Sir Tom, said that it's not limited to Charing Cross, and of course it's, uh, it's, it's not. So I just want, how do you reconcile? Yes, things are, whatever the phrase you use, certainly a lot better over nine years, and that's just happened. Well, of course, I didn't say everything is a lot better. and That's quite a fundamental thing. You know, it's, not, it's not just one or two rotten apples. It's of, one hell of, of a course barrel. not. You said a not insignificant number of officers. We don't know how many um, uh, are um, guilty of this kind of behaviour. Uh, there is, and there's, uh, you know, we've got uh, Eilish Angiolini uh, doing her report, uh, uh, Louise Casey's doing hers, we're doing ours, uh, uh, and there are others. Those will undoubtedly produce, um, I'm not preempting anything, I, you know, I would be extraordinarily surprised if they came out saying everything's fine. Of course they won't. And they will make recommendations for improvement. And the recruitment of officers... Uh, needs to be far more rigorous in the ways that I've described, so that when these attitudes are um, uh, revealed, when they are uh, apparent, then the police should stop these people going any further in the police and get them out. So that, can I just ask a question on that? Because what recently came to light was that some police forces were using online recruitment methods. And I think there was a quote from a, an officer who joined the force to say the first time he met anybody in person from that police force was when he was being measured for his uniform. Now, what you've just been saying to Mr Lawton about the, the issues around misogyny and homophobia and propensity to look to violence and all of that, are you satisfied that that online recruitment is going to be able to establish and pick up on those traits? I don't think it's universal online recruitment. No, no, it's not and, universal. It's some forces. Uh, and where it takes place, it is plainly inadequate. So you those police see... forces doing it should stop doing that now? Online only is not enough. Right, OK. okay. You need to get somebody in the room. You need to listen to them. You need to listen to them when their guard is down, when they're not pretending. 
You need to listen to them and see how they behave with their colleagues. Their supervisors and, and those who are making assessments of them need to get to know them and to talk to them in ordinary informal surroundings as well as formal surroundings to, be, to draw out those attitudes and behaviours. And the police do uh, employ psychologists and other professionals who can recognise these traits. And when they see them, they need to take them very seriously. And I am confident, particularly as a result of Charing Cross and the other uh, things that we've, uh, we've mentioned, that that will be taken very, very seriously indeed. But clearly, there were significant failures in the past. There's no doubt about it. I don't think I might be understood to say that the police are universally better in the last 10 years. But some things have got a great deal better, and some things really have not. Uh, Mr. Loughton mentions detection rates um, and, and, uh, and other things. And I discussed those things in my report on the 10th of March, which I hope I'll be able to come back and talk to you about. And does there need to be a Royal Commission on policing? Because that's being mooted at the moment, that things have changed so much in the last few decades in terms of policing that now is the time for a Royal Commission. Yes. Do you think that would be helpful? Oh, yes. Um, um, unfortunately, government ministers don't really much like Royal Commissions unless their objective is to kick things into the long grass. Uh, the last Royal Commission on the police was in 1960. Um, I've read every word of it and all the evidence. It was a, a piece of remarkable quality. Um, 62 years later is not premature. Um, but the government did promise in its um, 2019 uh, manifesto uh, a Royal Commission on Criminal Justice. Now, the pandemic has intervened, but I have no real expectation we're going to see that this side of whatever the next election is. I think that's regrettable. I think a Royal Commission on Criminal Justice is necessary, and it has the advantage that it could, as long as its terms of reference are not drawn too narrowly, be able to cover the police, but also the other three elements of the criminal justice system, prosecutions, prisons, and probation. Thank you. Um, I would just like to ask a specific question uh, about the BBC, who recently reported a quarter of the firearms licences returned between 2019 and 2021 went to people who had faced allegations of domestic abuse. And I just wondered what your view is, especially uh, Mr Wiltshire, because you, I think uh, it was said that you're the lead on domestic abuse uh, mm -hmm. in the inspectorate. What your view is about that and whether you think the police are failing victims of domestic abuse? Go first. I'll go first and okay. then hand over to Roy. Um, we did uh, a thematic report on firearms uh, in 2015, September 2015. We haven't been back since then because the Home Office asked us to do particular things and by definition ask us not to do certain things. Uh, we sounded warnings at that time about the return of licensed firearms to um, people who were suspected of um, domestic abuse and other intemperate behaviour. Um, since then, the police, um, sorry, the Home Office have made regulations. We recommended that the Home Office should make regulations in relation to the assessment of uh, people who are applying for or getting renewals for their licenses. And of course, the return of firearms uh, is, is pretty much the same sort of thing. Um, uh, so that there should be a proper assessment of the suitability of the person in question to get that firearm back or to have a firearms license. I'm pleased to say that six years later the government did make those regulations after a certain um, due process and now the regulations are tighter and um, the return of a firearms license will require uh, and indeed the grant of a firearms licence or the renewal of a firearms licence will require uh, a doctor's certificate uh, that the doctor has no reason to believe that the person in question is in some way mentally or in any other respect unsuitable. I don't think GPs are very happy about this and I think it may very well lead to a degree of reticence uh, on the part of GPs uh, not to take responsibility for something that they don't think they should be doing. So I rather think that um, uh, the number of firearms licenses uh, which are renewed and the number of uh, firearms which are returned will go down. But a, a GP wouldn't necessarily know there were allegations of domestic abuse? No, and therefore the police would uh, need to be able to uh, share that information with the GPs. I think this system has potential for a significant complexity. Mm. Yes, thank you. Mr Wiltshire. 
<coughs> it's, uh, I fully agree with Tom that uh, although there's been improvements, linking it to domestic abuse will be the, the police's responsibility. What I am pleased to say is there's a greater concentration on that area. I, mean, I was here in, in, in this house just two nights ago for the launch of the uh, campaign against violence against women and girls. You know, so uh, domestic abuse goes beyond women and girls, but it's a, it's a major part of that. Our report last September that came out under my colleague uh, Zoe Billingham on police engagement with women and girls made the recommendations, all have been accepted, particularly uh, violence against women and girls being part of the strategic policing requirement, which I think is a major step forward. We also welcome, under the National Police Chiefs Council, the uh, appointment of temporary, uh, temporary uh, Deputy Chief Constable Maggie Blythe, who's leading a, an action plan for every police force on how they deal with this issue. So we think the concentration of the police is, is much greater. Our own pill inspections look at the, the victim's journey, repeat offenders, how domestic abuse is investigated, the use of what's called Section 15 and 16, which is if there's no evidence to take a prosecution forward, or if the victim doesn't want to take prosecution forward, how consistent that is, and the standards that police uh, chief constables set for their engagement with domestic abuse. So what we think there's been a really you know, good uptake and improvement over the last year or so. Again, we want to see that sustained, mm -hmm. and we will be going back to look at how the police force has sustained that improvement. Well, can I thank you very much for uh, your evidence today? I also just think we should pay tribute to the fact that we have talked about a number of cases, um, and we've talked about Sarah Everard, but we've also talked about Bieber Henry and Nicole Smallman, and I just think we should recognise how um, deeply the public and this committee feels about those cases and how, as a police force going forward, um, issues and matters like that are dealt with that we never ever see those type of cases again within our police forces in this country um, but again thank you very much for your evidence today and I'm sure we will be following up particularly on the issues of diversity and inclusion in the fire and rescue service and we look forward to your report Sir Tom and we wish you uh, well in whatever you go on to do after the 31st of March and it may be we do see you again uh, once you're free of the, the office and um, perhaps you might want to come back and talk to us uh, with some further reflections. But thank you. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. The proceeding has ended.